welcome back everyone to the Dark Forest. Download your favorite scary story, Tales from the Dark Forest, on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Now, it's time to get spooky. I was 20 when I almost drowned in a lake. I was with my college buddies when it happened. Stupidly, we overlooked Joe's small fishing boat with supplies, and the boat capsized. But something else happened on the lake that day, which I've never spoken of. The monster living at the bottom of the lake tried to kill me. 25 years later, it's calling out to me again. We were up north when it happened. When I say up north, I'm talking 600 miles north of Toronto, so yeah, north. Me and Daniel were visiting our buddy Joe and his girlfriend Trina up in Kapiskeskin that summer. We were looking to catch some walleye and lake sturgeon and have ourselves a good time doing so. We spent the afternoon fishing along the Kapiskeskin River with mild to adequate success. Joe knew of a secret camping spot out on a shiny lake where the fish were always biting. He convinced us to go. It's an hour drive further north, he said, in the middle of Nowheresville. This was a new world for me and Daniel, who have never been this far north, and we were as green as the moss which seemed to be growing on everything we touched. We needed Joe's aluminum fishing boat to transport us to the small area. Needless to say, we overpacked the boat. We had three tents, two acoustic guitars, two coolers full of food, four cases of beer, fold-up chairs, and a ton of fishing gear. Not to mention bug spray, strong weed, and plenty of smokes. From all accounts, it started out as a fun weekend. We partied and jammed on the guitars and sang drunkenly all night long, blanketed by the stars and the endless northern sky. When it was fully dark, we sat transfixed around the campfire, while Joe told us scary stories regarding the monster living at the bottom of the lake. These stories, it is said, go back many generations. The monster, Joe told us, under the waning light of the crescent moon, had habited this lake for eons, long before any settlers dared to occupy this frigid northern land. Sometimes the monster gets hungry. That's when people go missing. Every year some poor fisherman goes missing at this lake, and no body is ever found. This is why the locals rarely, if ever, fish here. The lake may be small, Joe said, but it's deep. I thought he was telling tall tales, you know. Little did I know. The following day, after enjoying a delicious dinner of smoked pickerel, fried potatoes, and corn, Joe decided it was time to pack up the boat and head home before it gets dark. Once again, the boat was bogged down with our supplies. We all knew this was dangerous, but we did it anyways. To make matters worse, Nobody knew where we were. Remember, this was in the 90s, before smartphones. So it wasn't uncommon for people to disappear on fishing trips. Just ask Bill Bericklow. We had only spotted one other boater on the lake that day, a fisherman, and that was early in the morning. As far as we knew, we had this body of water all to ourselves. It was after 7 p.m. by the time we set our sad little vessel back into the water. Soon the sun would set and things would go wonky. I remember it clearly. Joe and Trina were situated at the back of the boat. Joe was struggling to guide the vessel across the bumpy lake. The boat wanted none of it. We were constantly being knocked back and forth, as if on a wooden roller coaster, and I could tell Joe was nervous. Something I had never seen before. Daniel sat at the bow. His job was to monitor the water level getting into the boat. It was an important job. 
He was in full panic mode from the get-go. We should never have put so much stuff in the boat, he complained over and over while spooning the water out of the boat. Of course, he was correct, but we were young and carefree and hopelessly naive. The lake was furious. Whitecaps rolled angrily across the entire bowl of water. Water was seeping into the boat at an alarming rate. I was sitting in the middle of the boat, doing nothing of value, watching as the anxiety on Daniel's face intensified. We were now in the middle of the lake. The water was a foot deep inside the boat, and the lake continued to pound us into submission. To make matters worse, only a speckle of sunlight remained. Time, as they say it, was of the essence. Joe boated us laboriously across the water as best he could. Our vessel was tearing dangerously low due to our negligence and the whitecaps continuing to submerge the boat. Daniel was having a panic attack. I will never forget the look of pure, unadulterated terror on Daniel's long, pale face that final moment before we sank the boat. Joe, he said. Joe, help! Those were his final words. His eyes were big and round and full of fear. He was frantically scooping the water out of the boat using a discarded tin can, but his efforts were futile. One minute, we were floating haphazardly across the drink. The next moment, we were underwater. The boat capsized. Our belongings either sank to the bottom of the lake or floated away. First, we removed our footwear. I was sad to see my Doc Martens fall at the bottom of the lake. Then we scrounged up the life preserves and put them on nice and snug. Then, we spent a good 15 minutes trying to flip the boat over, right side up, but failed. Instead, we wasted precious time and energy. Daniel, who was more scared than anyone I had ever seen up to then, was quickly becoming unnerved. It was sad to see. Trina, on the other hand, swam Olympian style across the lake and reached the shore 20 minutes later. Joe trailed close behind her. Neither of them hesitated. They just went for it. It was now me and Daniel stuck in the middle of the lake. The city slickers. Neither of us were sufficient swimmers. Daniel was going into shock. Just swim, I told him. I was trying to sound brave. Truth is, I can't swim to save my life. I never could. But with the life jacket on, I was willing to at least give it a shot. I could see Joe and Trina waving to us from shore, but barely. The sun was sinking fast. In 20 minutes or so, we'll be covered in a shroud of darkness. What then? I feared the worst. I swam. I swam like my life depended on it. If Trina and Joe can do it, I can too. Yes, I'm a lousy swimmer, but I swam, damn it. I swam. At some point, I looked behind me to check on Daniel, and to my horror, he was swimming backstroke, going the wrong way. Dan! I called out. You're going the wrong way! He didn't answer me. He was growing weak and wary. My arms and legs were dead tired. I was frightfully cold. My time was coming to an end. I realized this joylessly. I strained to see the speck of land off in the distance where Trina and Joe were waiting for us. Soon the shore would disappear completely and they would too. Something nudged my foot. Must be a fish, I told myself. A big one. I shook my leg, hoping to shoo it off. Then it happened again, only more forcibly. I started kicking my legs, looking to scare off whatever it was. It didn't work. Suddenly, I was scared. Something was underneath me. Something big. It latched onto my leg. It didn't let go. It forced me under the water. Frantically, I fought to free myself from whatever it was. 
I had no idea what was happening. Moments later, I came up coughing and wheezing, gasping for air. By this point, I was out of my mind, terrified. Dan! I shouted. My voice sank like a stone. Dan, you're going the wrong way! I swam to him. It took all my strength to do so. He was crying. Something snatched my foot again. Something brittle, like sandpaper. My leg was getting torn to shreds. The pain was uncompromising. What the hell was that? I asked through chattering teeth. The look stamped across Daniel's face said everything I needed to know. He had felt it too. There's something down there, I said. We gotta get moving. We swam. Unfortunately, the lake was not compliant and our efforts were futile. There was no use. We were both horrible swimmers. The lake had us all to itself, us and the monster. Daniel straightened out, and for a moment, I thought we had a fighting chance to reach shore. Then, he got pulled under. Dan! He was gone. I began splashing and making all the noise that I could. Dan! Something grabbed my leg and forced me under. For a moment, I was dead. I'm sure of this. I saw the bright light tunneling towards me. I went towards the light, and for a moment I was at peace. Then everything came rushing in. My lungs were filling with water. My body was thrashing about. I was being dragged down to the bottom of the lake. I opened my eyes. For a moment, all I could see was the murkiness of the lake water. Then I saw it. The monster. It took a moment to comprehend what I was witnessing. The monster was huge. It looked like a giant otter, only uglier. It had beady eyes, elongated whiskers and long, muscular arms with claws for hands, and teeth. I remember its teeth. Sharp, white, crooked and cruel. Beside me, netted in the monster's claws, was Daniel, who was missing his left arm. Blood was pouring out of him like paint from a can. His eyes were open and lifeless. I fought back as best I could. Unfortunately, my strength was at zero. I was towed to the bottom of the lake. The monster was easily twice my size and weight. Had me in like a bear hug. I could feel my vertebrae being crushed. Resistance seemed futile by this point. This was how I was going to die. Then I snapped out of it. I became alert, just as my lungs were about to burst. I fought the monster with everything I had. I went ballistic. I jerked and lurched and scratched and flailed about. I had no shame. Without warning, it released me, and I shot back up to the surface like a torpedo. The fresh air was better than sex. I took a moment to marvel in its wonder. Then I began searching for Daniel. I couldn't see him anywhere. By this point, I'm still struggling to catch my breath. Plus, I'm terrified of whatever was at the bottom of the lake. I was expecting to be hauled back down at any moment. My life jacket was torn to shreds, rendering it impotent, and I was going to drown. Then I hear a voice and my heart almost explodes. I look up and see this thin speck of light from another boat. It's the fisherman from earlier this morning. I was saved. Within minutes I'm discovered, and the fisherman hauled me into his boat. He offered me some hot coffee from his cooler. It tasted delicious. By this time, the darkness had arrived, along with the bugs which were on my nerves, but I didn't care. I was alive. I told him about Daniel. The look on the fisherman's face was not encouraging, but to his credit, 
we combed the lake for over an hour, only to come up empty-handed. My mind was still grappling with whatever just transpired. Should I tell this man about the monster at the bottom of the lake? Would he believe me? Would anyone believe me, for that matter? Or would they think I'm crazy? Ultimately, I didn't mention the monster at the bottom of the lake. I mean, who would? It's been many years since that summer on the lake, and I haven't spoken about this to a single soul. Although we did manage to fish my acoustic guitar from the lake, and never played the same since, Daniel's body was never found. He never did get the chance at finishing medical school and becoming a family doctor. That was his plan. It was tragic. His family, as you could imagine, was overwhelmed with grief. Recently, I received an email from Joe. He wanted me to visit him and Trina up in Kapuskaskin. It's been too long. Joe, who still loves the great outdoors, is as jaunty as ever. We should go camping at the lake, Joe said in his email. We'll take the kids and the guitars and the fishing rods and we'll have ourselves a blast and catch us some dinner while we're at it. Reluctantly, I agreed. As I ventured up to the attic of Ontario, I'm reminded again of the monster at the bottom of the lake. I hadn't thought of that lake-bound beast in many years, except in my dreams. Only in my dreams, I always end up as monster food. Now I can't get this out of my mind. There's a monster living at the bottom of the lake, the locals say. But of course, it can't be real. I'm a fully grown adult now. I don't believe in such folklore. This is my mantra. Apparently, the locals have since made t-shirts celebrating the monster at the bottom of the lake. We don't feed the monster. That's what city slickers do. Classy. I'll be sure to wear mine as we drop Joe's dinghy into the frigid northern lake. Winter's fast approaching, so we'll need to dress extra warm. Legend has it, the monster gets extra hungry this time of year. Lucky me. I still can't swim.